Welcome to the Reality Revolution. I'm your host, Brian Scott, and this is dedicated to all those spirits out there who believe life is meant to be magical and fun. Here we venture to share the very mysteries of self and reality. My purpose is to help light that spark inside of you, to reawaken your sense of fascination and awe towards the world. I'm going to try to help you hack reality and unleash your potential and open unlimited possibilities of wealth, health, and relationships in your life. Welcome, Awakened Ones. So happy you can join me today. Today I'm going to continue a series that I've been doing for a little while where I do deep dives on different chapters of the book Reality Transurfing by Vadim Zeeland. As I say, every time I do a review of one of these chapters or talk about the book, it's a wonderful book and you should definitely read it. It's one of those books that dedicates itself to multiple readings and upon each reading you will learn new and different things. It is deeper in nature than you think and on other podcasts when you uh, um, look at Bootsy Greenwood's channel where they were discussed, this is information that comes from before. This is older information. People have known about Reality Transurfing for a long time. That's why it's not copyrighted. Reality Transurfing is a model of understanding the world. While there are many different models, and I accept many of them very much as Cynthia Sue Larson describes, like a chef in a kitchen picking from different models to create the best flavor on how to understand this stuff. But doing deep dives is really helpful. And this particular chapter, there's a part of me that didn't want to do it because I'm so excited to do the Alternatives Flow chapter because that's going to make the best meditation, the Alternatives Flow, um, the Variations Flow. But And the Induced Transition has some negative stuff in it, but really it's a treatise on how to avoid negative information and negative energy. And we are living in a crazy time where the news is undeniably bad or weird or bizarre or crazy every time you turn it on. The kind of news that we get where they talk about disaster, war, unemployment, epidemics, panics, poverty, generation shifts. There's all these pendulum vortexes out there, especially with social media and Facebook and when you're watching Netflix or anything that you put your attention towards right now is using these things and so it's interesting because we he the last chapter was balance and so he he, there's some I, i think there's some in many ways these chapters each allow for a different opening up much like a flower and so they have something to do in order and so the part of me that didn't want to do it but then when i went read through it I, this is really in, important information right now when you follow the news on how to look at the news how to observe and work through the world where you have politics that's so divisive on such a level and you have a deep part of you that still wants to awaken and understand the world, that wants to meditate, that, that, that has questions about their soul and eternity and how do, we, how do we balance these things with these crazy things that are happening in the news with shootings and so many things and I've tried very hard in this podcast not to get political and... I don't want to do that. But the point of this is how do we deal with this news when we understand the model of reality creation that we create our own reality and we understand the model of parallel universes and reality transurfing and quantum jumping as mentioned by Cynthia Sue Larson. And when we understand that, there is a need to dedicate a specific period of time to avoiding the induced transition. Now we've had chapters on wave, the wave of fortune and how important your reactions are to in, in incidents, small things. The wave of fortune really is a small transition that it, when you have one good event, you make a big deal about it. It's a way to really focus on the moment and that one thing. This goes to another level and you can get pulled into lifelines and parallel realities when you focus on particular kinds of news. And so this is kind of a guideline on how to observe these different things of news. And so I'm going to read through this and we will talk about it as we go. But people have always hankered after the good old days 
as Zeeland says, with age, life somehow seems to get worse. People turn to reminiscing about their youth and times when the colors were richer, first impressions more vivid, dreams attainable, music was better, the climate more favorable, people were more approachable, and the meat was more tender to say nothing of their health. Life was full of hope, pleasure and joy. Once a certain number of years have passed, people begin to sense that events do not make them as happy as they did before. Now, how many people out there have that feeling? That you look back on the past and all this joy that you had and that it's deadening and it's not the same. How many different things, the food doesn't taste as good. The movies aren't as good. How many people out there are experiencing that right now? Picnics, parties, concerts, films, celebrations, dates, warm seawater. From an objective point of view, all of these things are still pretty much the same quality as they were before parties are still fun, films are still interesting, and seawater still feels warm. Nonetheless, life is not the same as it used to be. The colors have faded, our responses have dulled, and enthusiasm has waned. Why is it everything has so much more wonderful when we are younger? Can it really be that our perception of things loses its sharpness as we grow older. We do not lose the ability to laugh, cry, perceive, taste and color, distinguish truth from deceit or differentiate between good and bad. Just because we're a little older So could the world gradually be going downhill? No, the world is not deteriorating. Things only seem to be getting worse to certain people. What actually happens is that a person shifts to a negative lifeline. Now a lifeline is a line of reality that you exist in a script that you're moving in of all the different possibilities for you in the space of variations there's a line that you go on if you marry that person if you marry that person if you take that job if you take that job and that's a lifeline and you can be on a lifeline where you're in the same job in the same situation and one can become negative and positive when when it says what actually happens is that a person shifts to a negative lifeline that runs in parallel with former lifelines where everything is just as fine now as it was before the individual left them behind. By expressing dissatisfaction, a person attunes themselves to lifelines that draw them in and where things generally are worse than before. According to the principles of transurfing, the alternative space The space of variations has everything for everybody. In one sector, the colors of life have become gray, while in another life remains as bright and cheery as it always was. A person who emanates negative thought energy ends up drawn into a sector with a different type of scenery but the world remains the same for everyone else. This is true not only in extreme cases in which someone has become an invalid, lost their home, their loved ones, or have become alcoholic and ruined their life. And in most cases, during the course of their life, a person regularly slides onto different lifelines where the colors of the scenery are duller than they were on a previous lifeline. When this happens, 
a person begins to reminisce about how vivid and fresh everything was years ago. When a child is born, they accept the world the way it is. A child is unaware of the fact that life could change becoming better or worse. Young people have not yet been spoiled, and so they are less picky. They are still busy with the task of discovering the world for themselves and enjoying life because they have more hope than cause for complaint. They think that life is pretty much okay and expect it to get even better. With time, they experience misfortune and failure and begin to understand that not all dreams come true, that some people are better off and they have to fight for their place in the sun. As time goes by, they can end up with more cause for complaint than hope. Discontentment and whining become a moving force that pushes a person onto unsuccessful lifelines. Expressed in reality creation and transurfing terms, this type of person radiates negative energy, which transfers them onto lifelines that corresponds to the negative parameters of their own thought energy. Now this this chapter might be tough for me to create a meditation on. But we're gonna we're gonna dive into this, and I mean uh, that would be in another episode. As I've tr- done with this series so far, I've created meditations or hypnosis in, with each of these uh, chapters to kind of lock in this line of thinking. And so, it's very similar to the way of fortune. So we need to see what the differentiation is. But life is less satisfactory the worse you think it is to be. And children rarely contemplate whether their childhood is good or not. As children, we take everything for granted. We've only just begun discovering the world and have not yet acquired the habit of criticism. The greatest insult was experienced as children is not being bought a much wanted toy by a relative. It is only as we get a little older that we start to resent the world around us for fulfilling us less and less. The more we complain, the worse things are as a result. Everyone who has survived their youth and reached a mature age will say that a lot of things were better when they were younger. That is the paradox you come up against. Circumstances that disappoint you And so you express your dissatisfaction, which then aggravates the situation even more. Your discontent comes back to you like a triple force boomerang. Now I'm going to repeat that sentence again from the book. Your discontent comes back to you like a triple force boomerang. Firstly, the excess potential created by your discontent turns balanced forces against you. Secondly, your discontent serves as a channel through which a pendulum being can draw on your energy. And third, radiating energy, you shift onto lifelines of a corresponding vibration. Now, this is an interesting thing. I don't know if it's a translation error. It's maybe one of the few times where he refers to a pendulum being Your discontent serves as a channel through which a pendulum being can draw on your energy. I'll have to look up when when I get a chance here. Pendulum being, in fact, I can do it now. When you look up certain phrases, it's interesting to do on reality trend surfing. And pendulum being is only pronounced three times and the first time it says a resonance 
It says, if a follower rebels against the laws of structure, the frequency of their of their thought energy ceases to be in harmony with the resonance frequency of the pendulum being deprived of essential energy. The pendulum either drives the maverick adherent out of system or destroys them. And then the other time is... doesn't say it so that's the only two times so thirdly radiating negative energy you shift onto lifelines of a corresponding vibration so we need to raise our vibration we need to raise our vibration so we can move into a vibration that's why i'm also playing high vibration music when we do these podcasts thanks to metaverse keep an eye out for my interview with this wonderful musician that does the music behind most of the episodes of the reality revolution and brian larson is his name it's going to be awesome but the habits of reacting negatively is so deep-seated that human beings are being are beginning to lose their advantage over other creatures further down the food chain in their capacity for awareness An oyster also reacts negatively to external irritants, but unlike the oyster, a human being is able to consciously and intentionally regulate their relationship with the external world. Nevertheless, most people do not use the benefit of awareness, instead responding aggressively to the slightest inconvenience. Aggression is mistaken interpreted as strength But in fact, a person who chooses to express themselves aggressively might as well, metaphorically speaking, be quivering helplessly in a pendulum's web. You might think that life is not as good as it used to be, but the younger generation happens to think that life is wonderful. Maybe they just do not know how great things were when they were their age. Having said that, when you were young, the older generation complained about life too and reminisced about the good old days. This pattern cannot simply be explained by the tendency of the human psyche to erase all negative memories, leaving just the positive ones. The criticism is aimed at the present moment, which is supposedly worse than it used to be. If you accept the fact that life is getting worse with every passing year, then you would have to agree that the words, the world, should have simply fallen to pieces a long time ago. An uncountable number of generations have passed since the beginning of human history, and each one believes that life's colors have faded. Many an old man will tell you with absolute certainty how much better Coca-Cola used to be. Coca-Cola was invented in 1886. Imagine how disgusting Coke must be by now if it has been consistently worsening in quality since then. Or perhaps one's senses of taste weaken with age. Although it's hardly the case. Anyway, the old man will probably tell you everything else is a poor quality today too. Be it furniture, clothes, or any other item. If the world were the same for everyone, after several dozen generations, life would become a nightmare for everybody. So how should we understand the paradoxical statement that the world is not the same for everyone? We all live in the same world comprised of the material realization of alternative lifelines, and yet every individual experiences a different possible alternative. On the surface of things, there are obviously differences in people's fate. Some are rich, some are poor, some are successful, and some are struggling. Some are lucky, and some are unlucky. We all have our own personal reality within the common world we live in. It seems quite straightforward, just as there are rich, poor neighborhoods in a single town. The script, role, and the scenery differ in different manifestations of reality the difference in scenery is harder to track 
One person looks at the world from the window of their luxurious car, whilst another peeks at it from inside a rubbish container. He always refers to garbage cans as rubbish containers. One person enjoys the party, whilst another consumed it in thought about their problems. One sees a group of happy youths, another at a gang of hooligans. They are looking at the same thing, but the images they perceive differ as black and white film differs from color. Every individual is attuned to their own sector in the alternative space, and so everyone lives in their own personal world. All these worlds exist in layers that exist one on top of the other, forming what we understand to be the space we live in. It might be difficult to imagine, but no one layer can be separated from another. Every individual creates their own reality, and the reality intersects and interacts with the rest of the world around us. Imagine what the earth was like before any single living creature existed. Winds blow. Rains fall. Volcanoes erupt and rivers flow. And then suddenly a person is born, begins to observe their environment. The energy of that person's thought stimulates the material manifestation of a certain sector of the alternative space which represents their specific life in this specific world. Then another person is born who generates another layer. One person dies and a layer disappears or perhaps is transformed depending on what happens beyond the threshold of death. We are vaguely aware that other forms of life exist in parallel worlds of some kind. Let us suppose for a moment there are no living creatures in these worlds whatsoever, at least not yet. What kind of energy would stimulate the material manifestation of space that contained no single living creature? We can only guess. Perhaps once the last living creature dies, the world itself will disappear. Who can prove that the world exists if there's nobody in it? For if there are no people who would be around to say that the world in our understanding exists at all, there would be no world to speak of. And I could have skipped this part of the chapter, the whole thing, but it's pretty powerful to think about. and interesting and powerful in many ways. But that is enough speculation for now, he says. We do not want to get bogged down in abstract conjecture. Remember, though, that transurfing is just one of many models. All existing theories about the world and life in it are nothing but models. And this is a great point. He's never claiming that this is the best model and that the model is true. He's never claiming that this model is the answer to everything. Remember also the notion of importance and try to avoid projecting any outer importance on to the transurfing model of the universe. Otherwise, you could become an apologist for the futile ideas and try proving to everyone the truth of your own subjective worldview. Who's guilty of that when you start discussing these ideas? You want to discuss it with other people and then, they, and then you kind of want to prove it to them. But this is the key thing to remember with transurfing and why it's such a powerful model. Our goal here lies exclusively in attaining maximum practical benefit from our preferred model of the universe. So 
The correct model doesn't matter as much as the preferred model. What's going to give us the greatest benefit to our actual lives? The model that we take on will affect the the world around us. So there is a benefit to this model when you act consistently with the precepts of this model of transurfing. Now let us return to the topic of generations. Throughout their lifetime, a person reattunes their energy from vibration of one sector in the alternative space to another, thereby transforming the layer of their personal world. The more a person readily expresses their discontent emanating large quantities of negative energy, the more strongly the tendency for the quality of their life to deteriorate is consolidated. A man could acquire great material wealth with age, but not necessarily by any be any happier for it. The colors of his scenery could just as well fade and life could become less enjoyable. The older and the younger generation both drink the same Coca-Cola, swim in the same ocean, ski on the same mountain slopes, and everything is pretty much the same as it was many years ago. However, the older man is convinced that in his day everything was better and the young person is convinced that the things are better now and when the young person grows old, the story will no doubt repeat itself. And this is a real warning. You do hear what he is saying that we, by our mental model, will become older because it's layer of reality that we has built into this And perhaps we can break this by the way we think in the shift in our thinking. There are deviations from this tendency, both for the better and the worse. Sometimes a person only begins to develop a taste for life as they get older. And the opposite can happen. A successful man can go downhill until he hits rock bottom. That said, in general, the generations agree that life gets worse as you get older. This is how the shift in generational layers takes place. The layer of the older generation shifts to a line of poor quality, and the layer of the younger generation gradually follows on behind. The shift takes place gradually each time, starting from a point of optimism. This is precisely why the world as a whole never actually transforms into a living hell. Everyone has their own layer, which they choose themselves. By now, you'll have a clear picture of how the choice can be made to one's personal detriment. In previous episodes of the Reality Revolution, we've already talked about how to avoid creating a living hell in your own life layer. You may also wonder whether it's possible for a person to retrieve an earlier section of their world. Well, Vadim Zeeland says, or return to a lifeline that was fulfilled with color and hope like it was in your childhood. The transurfing technique can help with this task, but before we look at that, it is first useful to understand how exactly a person can end up shifting from a lifeline full of success and hope to a lifeline where they face the question, so how exactly did my life end up like that? And so the rest of this chapter is a, is a list of different things can, that can induce you in to a negative lifeline. And there's some key nuggets in each of these chapters. He starts out with the pendulum vortex. The human psyche works in such a way that it reacts most strongly to negative irritants such as unwanted information, hostility, danger, or any other form of negative energy. Of course, positive influences can also stir strong emotions. But the intensity and force of emotions like fear and rage by far outweigh those of joy and happiness. The reason for this originates in ancient times when fear and rage were crucial to survival. What use is joy in a context like that? Joy is not a useful when it comes to defending yourself, avoiding danger and foraging for food. In addition, throughout the entire history of humanity, life has been filled with burden and hardship that have brought on more grief and fear than joy and happiness. 
This is generationally speaking, why man yields readily to thoughts of gloom and depression, while feelings of joy and happiness pass relatively quickly. Have you ever heard a normal person suffering from too much joy? People who suffer from stress and depression, however, can be found in good number wherever you look. Pendulums in particular, the mass media, actively make use of these particular features of human perception. You rarely hear anything good in the news. Usually in a news program, you hear a negative fact followed up with news coverage new details gradually emerge and the details of the story are thoroughly savored and dramatized. Other negative news stories covering catastrophes, natural disasters, terrorist acts, and armed conflicts are presented according to the same principles. Notice the pattern. Events develop in a spiral of intensity. First, there's a catchy headline and the story is unraveled, exposing further details. The tension gradually peaks with emotions running equally high. Finally, the story comes to its conclusion and all that emotional energy is released into space as a temporary calm descends upon the viewers. Endless TV series are based on the same pattern of buildup and release like waves breaking on the shore. From an objective point of view, there is nothing special about these programs. All the drama is literally created out of thin air. However, you only have to watch two or three episodes and you're hooked. Why is this? After all, nothing particularly interesting ever happens. You become hooked because the frequency of your thought energy is caught up by the pendulum of the TV series and your attention becomes fixed on that sector within the alternative space of variations. This is the mechanism that winds the spiral mentioned above or recently previous. At first, a person is confronted with a fact which theoretically they may not find upsetting. Let us suppose that the fact is a fresh place of news about a negative event that has taken place somewhere in another country. This represents Destructive Pendulum's first prod. If a person is touched by news story, they respond to the stimulus by expressing their thoughts and feelings about it. If the news concerns them, they will begin radiating energy at the same frequency as the pendulum's initial prod. I am telling you, there is no reason for you to ever watch the news. And it shouldn't be called the news. It should be called the bad news. So if you're watching it, just make sure you, as a reminder, to call it the bad news. Or what are you watching? I'm watching the bad news. Because that's what it is. Like thousands of others, the person responds to the pendulum with the interest, thereby participating in the overall event. The vibration of the person's thought energy begins to resonate with the pendulum, increasing the force of its energy. Meanwhile, the media continues its campaign. The person follows developments with interest, making sure that the pendulum receives its nourishment. This is a typical example of how a pendulum entices adherence into its web so that it can continually suck energy from them. The person who becomes increasingly interested in the news absorbs some of its negative energy. And whether they are aware of it or not, they are now involved in a game, at least as an observer. At first glance, it does not look as if something untoward has happened. 
Watching the news is a matter of course. So what if a person gives a bit of their energy to a destructive pendulum? It is not as if they will affect their health. When a person begins radiating energy at the frequency of a negative event, they shift onto a lifeline that is located closer to other lifelines in which such events take place. They begin to play a part in the plot. They find themselves within the impact area of a spiral that rotates faster and faster, drawing them into a vortex, like water into the funnel of a whirlpool. The interaction between the individual and pendulum become increasingly close, and the person accepts the event as an as unavoidable part of their life. Their attention becomes selective, and it will seem as if new facts about similar events in different countries are popping up everywhere. The person will discuss the news with their close friends and relatives who will no doubt respond with interest and compassion. The energy of the pendulum grows as a result of the individuals drawn ever closer by the frequency of their thought energy to the lifeline of the original event, except at this stage they are no longer an observer but a direct participant. The phenomenon of being drawn further towards the vortex can be described as an induced transition to a lifeline where the adherent becomes the victim of a destructive pendulum. The individual's response to the pendulum's initial prod and the mutual exchange of energy that follows induces a shift to a lifeline with a vibration very similar to that of the pendulum sway. As a result, a negative event occurs in the layer of the person's life. So you get sucked into the pendulum's energy. And then some negative thing happens within the same vibration of that negative energy. He has a section on disaster saying most people accept that theoretically they could end up being involved in a catastrophic event, but not all actually allow the possibility into the layer of their personal world. There are people who do not watch TV serials, have no interest in the news, and are emotionally undisturbed by events taking place somewhere else in the world. They live in a different life layer to these events and are adherents of other pendulums. They remain undisturbed by the fact that somewhere in the world there's been a plane crash. They listen to the news indifferently while they eat their supper, probably because they have enough to deal with in their own lives. The type of person most likely to undergo an induced shift shows active interest in disasters that involve other people and take place in other areas. This kind of person is deeply disturbed by news of such events. Sometimes when a person suffers few problems of their own, there's a tendency to fill the empty space in their lives by giving their attention to events taking place in life layers other than their own. This type of person regularly reads the tabloids, watches TV series, or awaits news updates on tragic accidents and natural disasters. Like I had a friend once that had an alert on natural disasters and I was like, why would you want to be alerted if it's not in your area? Like being told about something that's happened in another country across the whole world. Tabloids and soap operas are the activities of small, harmless pendulums Adherence to pendulums in this category does nothing more than make up for a deficit of information, emotion, and experience in a person's own life. In contrast, displaying an active interest in catastrophes and natural disasters poses a real threat, for these are manifestation of stronger, more aggressive pendulums. 
the vibration of thought energy radiating from a person who gives their attention to tragic events is hooked in the same way as it is by a television series. Anyone who looks for negative information will always find an abundance of it. At first they play the innocent role of observer like a person watching a football match from the grandstand. A football match. Sounds very Russian. The game gradually becomes gripping and the observer becomes a fan. Then they walk onto the playing field and start to run about, waiting for the ball. Gradually, unnoticeably, the fan becomes more involved in the game. And in the end, another player will pass them the ball. Metaphorically speaking, the original observer has become a player, a victim of disaster. I don't know, I guess he's speaking against becoming a fan right there. Could it really be otherwise? A person allows information related to disaster to become part of their life. They unwittingly accept the fate of victims and eventually materialize misfortune in an alternative lifeline. Of course, the person had no intention of becoming a victim. But that is unfortunate of no consequence because once a person has agreed to join the role that they will play is chosen by the pendulum. Whereas for many people, personal involvement in in a disaster would signify the result of a fatal train of events for our first victim. It could represent the logical end to a line of behavior that increased the probability of their own being in the wrong place at the wrong time. If you ignore the prod of a destructive pendulum, you'll never end up involved in a catastrophic event, or at least the probability of happening will be close to zero. You may object that thousands of people have lost their lives in tragic accidents and natural disasters. Surely, not all these people were thinking about catastrophes simultaneously. The thing is, we do not live alone in the world. We are surrounded by other people who are actively working for destructive pendulums and radiating energy within the pendulum spectrum. It is not possible to become totally and ideally isolated from these vibrational frequencies. The common field encompasses you and without being consciously aware of it, you begin to radiate energy at the same frequencies as the surrounding field. The roots of this type of behavior go back to very ancient times when the herd instinct helped to protect the group from danger. This is why the energy field of an induced shift produces a snowball effect that pulls you in like water to the center of a whirlpool. The task is to stay as far away as possible from the pendulum's vortex. This means not absorbing negative information relating to catastrophic events and disasters, showing no interest, refraining from worry or discussion, and generally letting the information pass you by. Notice that we say, let the information pass you by rather than try to avoid it. If you're trying to avoid it, then you'll get more of it. As we know from previous episodes that I've talked about, trying to avoid a meeting with a pendulum is the same as seeking out meeting it. Just like me saying, don't think about an elephant. You're going to think about an elephant. When you resist something, desire specifically to avoid something or express your enmity towards something, you actively radiate energy at the frequency of the object you're trying to avoid. To let something pass you by means not to absorb or react to negative information. Simply ignore it and switch your attention to harmless television programs and books. So he is saying it's okay for us to switch our attention to harmless television programs and books. (laughs) Yes! All right. If you find it impossible to retain a positive outlook, when confronted with negativity, you can always turn to your guardian angel. For example, if you're afraid of flying, stay away from planes. If you're afraid, it means that somewhere in the spectrum of your energy, there's a frequency that resonates at the vibration of a lifeline in which a plane crash occurred. Maybe John Madden knew all that time that he was just avoiding that vibration when he rode a bus to every single Monday night football game that he did. It does not mean that you will immediately transition to this lifeline, but nonetheless, the possibility exists. 
you're the kind of person who does not think of the dangers of flying at all, then you have nothing to fear. On the other hand, if you experience unusually high levels of anxiety before boarding a plane, it would be wise to skip the flight. If this was totally out of the question, you would be wise to learn to listen to the rustle of the morning stars. What is... What is that, the rustle of the morning star? What that is and how it can be heard? You have yet to discover, he says. So when you have that anxiety, and as I've talked about on re- in previous pe- episodes, why is it less people get on the train when there's accidents? People have stated many times getting off planes, trains, automobiles, where there was an accident ahead because they listen to this anxiety. So if there is an, an excessive level of anxiety, I think that's a good explanation to to pay attention to your intuition in those cases. He has a section on wars, talking about how do you deal with wars when wars break out essentially for the same reason that that fistfights do. One party expresses their opinion, the other party holds the opposite opinion. And so the opinion expressed by the first is like the prod of a destructive pendulum. And the second party takes offense at the prod and reacts with double the amplitude. The first shot back even louder. Both parties become increasingly aggressive until things become finally come to blows. The meta- this metaphor illustrates the battle between two pendulums that knock against each other, causing each to swing higher and higher. Obviously, the outbreak of war or build-up to a revolution involves all sorts of complex factors. But essentially, the process is the same. The pendulum primes the people by telling them they do not have a good life and that people are quick to agree. It is then explained that the reason they do not live well is because other people are preventing them from doing so. This stirs resentment and the pendulum begins to swing. Then one side provokes the other, evoking a storm of anger whereby the pendulum gathers force and the war or revolution can begin. Each swing on the, of the pendulum generates a response which strengthens the pendulum's sway still further. A snowball effect is initiated until a shift occurs to a lifeline with mounting tension. The situation can only be changed at the outset, before things escalate, out of control at the moment when the spiral begins to turn and the pendulum makes its first move. If the other party responds peacefully or simply walks away, the pendulum will be brought to rest or defeated. If, however, the pendulum's prod is accepted, the participant's energy will correspond to the parameters of the lifeline on the next turn of the spiral. It's when I read stuff like this that it feels like that we're reading something that maybe he found that's older. Because this is very basic. Unfortunately, there is no guarantee that an individual participant will not be pulled into the events of a war or revolution, even if they manage not to court to respond to the pendulum. If you get pulled into a powerful whirlpool, however hard you try, it's almost impossible to free yourself from the current that pulls towards the center. If, however, a participant refuses to play the pendulum's game, they will at least have greater chances of surviving with minimal loss. Here we should be clear about what it means not to tolerate war or revolution. You could hate war or be actively campaigning against it. It makes no difference to the pendulum which side of the fence you stand on. It will claim your energy in both cases. If energy is emanated on the frequency of a war, shift will occur into a corresponding lifeline. If you accept war and participate in it, then you are effectively on the battlefield. If you fight against war, it will consume you anyway. Not to accept the pendulum's game means to ignore it. I realize that it is not always possible to ignore something like war, but this is the danger of the induced shift. It is not worth taking the position of defender or opponent of war. There have always been neutral countries which have remained on the sidelines and watched while entire nations destroyed each other. From the point of view, the pendulum trying to provoke a fight with its rivals, people who ardently protest against war at demonstrations are potentially just as committed and desirable adherents as the supporters of conflict. Active protest against war potentially provides the pendulum 
with just as much energy as the support of war, although naive adherents will be convinced of the opposite. The real way to prevent war is simply to pre- support peaceful action and where it possibly expose a pendulum's true motives. Do you remember the metaphor of the hive of the wild bees? The pendulum tells its adherents that the bees are dangerous and must be killed. What is the pendulum's true motive? What does it really need? In an earlier episode, we talked about pendulums and it's like hitting a hive of bees and the bees go crazy and then you get mad at the bees because they stung you when you hit the hive of bees which was sitting there and it didn't need to be bothered in the first place. He has a, ch- he has a, a chapter talking about unemployment and as we have said there are different ways of playing the game of a destructive pendulum either by supporting it or negating it the second option is probably the most perilous since the desire to actively avoid a pendulum creates excess potential that can pull you into the vortex of an induced transition almost everyone nowadays experiences concern at some point or another about losing their job An induced transition to finding yourself out on the street would be quite a crafty maneuver. Sometimes larger events start with something small and seemingly harmless. An initial faint signal, for example, you might hear that your company is not doing quite as well as it was before or someone you know lost their job. Or there are rumors at work that staff staff have to be made redundant. On a subconscious level, an otherwise unnoticeable red light comes on shortly afterwards. You pick up on such a signal as reports that inflation is sky high. This keeps you and those around you on their toes. People start talking about their concerns and the unemployment pendulum is provided with a source of energy. Then there's news about an impending drop in the stock market and the general tension increases. Concern quickly go gives way to anxiety and then fear, and by this time you are already generating energy to the vibration of a lifeline where you can see yourself without a job. If you're afraid that you will end up being one of those ma- ones made redundant, your fear is perceptible to others as you were wearing a placard saying, I might be made redundant. If you think you can hide your fear, you're mistaken body language and the slightest intonation in your voice say more than a thousand words once you lose confidence in yourself you become less efficient tasks that you found easy before seem more difficult a certain tension seeps into your communication with colleagues who are in the same position You take your anxiety home with you, and instead of support, you find your family begin to complain and criticize. Stress levels rise, and you're no longer an efficient employee. And at this stage, you might as well be wearing a sign saying, waiting to be be fired. The fear of being fired lies in a feeling of guilt, which either smolders away or burns brightly in your subconscious. They always fire the weakest employees first, and if you allow yourself to consider that you might be weaker than your colleagues, you effectively write your own name into the blacklist. Let go of guilt. Give yourself the luxury of being you. If that doesn't work, start looking for another job, because the excess potential of your emotional worries will be dissipated by taking action. Some people start looking for another job as soon as they have taken on a new position. Not because they intend to change jobs immediately, because the idea of having a safety net makes them feel more confident. On the off chance that something unexpected does happen, they know they have an alternative avenue to follow. And if you feel secure about the future, the action of balanced forces will not affect you. He has a section on it, on epidemics. And if you're probably thinking that an epidemic can have no relevance to lifelines and that people get ill simply because they have become infected by some bacteria, this is correct. But only so far as a person allows themselves to become infected. And by this, I do not mean they were not wearing a protective health mask. 
That would not have saved them. Zeland says he cannot prove his point with the theoretical argument, just as he cannot prove anything he says in his book. Just as you would not walk around with a mask on during a flu epidemic, just to test whether the mask works or not. He says he's sharing what he knows to be true. Whether it resonates with you or not, you can only know. He's saying that you can have an effect on how you deal with these epidemics. You can be brought to epidemics. So let us... I believe we would create our reality. So yeah, if you focused on epidemics, I believe you'd create it. So let us unravel the stages of disease. The cause of, of an illness is your voluntary agreement to play the game called epidemic. And it all begins with rumors that somewhere in an epidemic, the flu, for example, is going around. Everyone knows that the flu is transmitted through the respiratory system. And so you, like everyone else, totally accept the possibility that you could come down with something. You immediately run the being of sick scenario through your mind. You imagine having a temperature, lying in bed, coughing and sneezing. From this moment on, you're playing the pendulum's game because your imagination is shaping your thought energy to the same frequency as the destructive pendulum. Your subconscious starts searching for confirmation of an onset of an epidemic and your attention becomes selective. You seem suddenly to be surrounded by people sneezing. They're always there. It is just that you did not notice them before. And from time to time, at work, at home, someone will raise the subject of the flu. Your suspicion that an epidemic is on its way is confirmed by the mere evidence that you see, the more and more evidence. And even if you're not particularly looking for confirmation or the subject does not particularly worry you, somehow confirmation given its own accord. Now, if you think about it, this is the big chapter he talked about in the Wave of Fortune, small reactions in the moment. This is the stuff that can kill you. And so this stuff, this might be the most important chapter. And I've seen it before. I've seen people have bad things happen or get be stuck in bad areas. And their response to, their, to the conditions that happen really mess up everything. If from the very beginning of the game, You've attuned yourself to the frequency of the destructive pendulum. Your bond with it will become stronger, regardless of whether your participation is conscious. If you're not against the idea of being sick, or if you feel that you are, for some reason bound to come down with something, that you become an active and inherent. And on the other hand, you decide that you cannot afford to be ill. Keep telling yourself how totally healthy you are. But that does not work. Just thinking about the illness means that you're attuning your energy to its frequency. And that's interesting. I want to create a good health meditation. And I have one I've tried to do before, the Bliss Body meditation. Uh, But this is the the trans surfing idea is just thinking about it. We need to be able to train our brains to simply not think about something. And it's hard to do that. But I think if we can, through possibly through hypnosis, that might work. Words spoken aloud are simply warm air. And words spoken to oneself are nothing at all in comparison to the inaudible power of faith. Without faith, you will not protect yourself from the flu. Even if you rush to get a flu vaccination. It makes no difference because whatever you do, you'll be ill for as long as you need to be. The first symptoms provide you with a choice of whether you are going to come down with something serious or recover very quickly. You might make a weakest attempt to resist, but finally you face the fact that you're going to be ill. With the final adjustment is made, your energy vibration and you shift to a lifeline where illness is prevalent. The induced shift actually starts from the very moment that you respond to the pendulum's prod. If you generally could not care about the epidemic, you will not be affected by it. And it's hard. What he's saying is to be desensitized to some of this stuff. The thing is that doctors also actively playing the game of the illness pendulum. They, they're, they're, they play an entirely different role. By analogy, the next time you fly, notice the stewardess on the plane. They whiz up and down the cabin like little angels, insistently advising passengers to fasten their seatbelts. And yet they are 
so mobile in the cabin, one suspects that if anything happened, they would simply hover in the air like hummingbirds. What about breastfed babies infected with AIDS, the fastidious reader will ask. <laughs> Do they too radiate the energy of an induced transition? In response, it should be said that firstly we are looking at the phenomenon of an epidemic as a general tendency, and secondly, he's not suggesting the concept of infection is a delusion or that thought energy radiating at the frequency of illness is the sole cause of ill health. Transurfing is neither a dogma nor does it claim to be the final authority on truth. No idea should be taken to the, to the absolute truth. We can only take into account patterns and regularities. Truth is always somewhere close by, but where exactly nobody can say. That is the answer to people who say that the transferring sayings that you, you shouldn't go to the doctor or shouldn't get a vaccine. It's saying all the science stuff is important, but your, mem but your attitude is also important. He has a section on panic that is very good and avoiding panic and and that pendulums can induce panic he has a, a very good section on poverty and gotta read it I mean this is a great section and from a logical point of view how does a simple man from a slums become rich not including a criminal means or beautiful stories about people becoming millionaires overnight the rags to riches story is very difficult to explain using only common sense so what you may ask is the use of logic transurfing does not entirely fit into the framework of common sense on the other hand it does enable you to achieve things that would otherwise appear impossible when your actions are based on logical deductions, you're, you get a corresponding result. And if a person is born in poverty, they will be accustomed to living in poor circumstances and their energy will be attuned to the frequency of their own misfortune. It is very difficult to shift to a lifeline of prosperity. If you despise your own poverty, envy the wealth, and constantly wish you were better off. Actually, I would say that with these three types of thought in mind, it is completely impossible. So he's saying it's completely impossible to find wealth if you're a person, if you have those three things. It is difficult to shift to a lifeline of prosperity if you despise your own poverty, envy the wealthy, and constantly wish you were better off. So we're going to remove those thoughts. We're going to find a way, maybe in meditation, to, to remove, despise your own poverty, envy, love your poverty, no envy, and constantly wishing you were better off. One of the first discoveries children make as they get older is the fact that just because you would hate for something to happen, it does not mean you can avoid it happening. Sometimes the soul simply cries out in despair. But I don't want it. I, I hate it. Why does this always happen to me? It is not only children who ask themselves this question in fits of anger, but adults too. It is difficult to accept the fact that even though you do not want something to happen, there is nothing that you can do about it. And you hate something, it will follow you around wherever you go. You can harbor hatred for poverty, your work, your physical flaws, your neighbors, drunks, alcoholics, drug addicts, dogs, thieves, criminals, the impudent child, the government, the list goes on. The more you love to hate something, the more likely you are to have experience of it in your life. The reason for this is clear. And I know that everybody out there has things that they hate. And if you don't, good for you. The more you love to hate something, the more likely you are to have experience of it in your life. The reason for this is clear. When something gets to you, you think about it, which means you radiate at the frequency of a lifeline, 
where that thing exists in abundance. It does not matter which polarity you embody, liking or not liking. The second is of greater benefit to the pendulum because emotions associated with not liking are more powerful than emotions associated with liking. The destructive pendulum sways even higher when you're suffering emotionally. Finally, when you actively hate something, you create excess potential. Balanced forces are then directed against you because it's easier for them to eliminate one opponent than to change a world that does not suit one individual who would have thought there could be so many harmful aspects to a negative attitude towards life. In the case of the individual who is born in poverty but dreams of becoming rich, we know that desire itself is not enough to initiate change. Often people do their dreaming, lounging about on the sofa, having the occasional stretch and thinking how much they would like a bowl of strawberries, but not knowing where to get them in the middle of winter. If you're not prepared to take action to acquire what you want, you will not get it. A poor person usually does not take action because of their own conviction that the fulfillment of their desire is not realistic. It is a vicious circle. Desire of itself has no power. Desire fails even to lift a finger. Intention, the readiness to act, is the force that lifts the finger. With intention, a person could just as easily say, you can't take this away from me. It's simple. I just want to be rich. Again, there's a huge chasm between wanting and being ready to become. For example, a poor person tends to feel out of place in the company of the wealthy or an expensive shop, even if they are desperately trying to convince themselves and others that the opposite is true, because in their hearts, they believe they're not worthy of the environment. Wealth is not a part of per poor person's comfort zone and not because it's uncomfortable to be wealthy, but because it's so unfamiliar. A new armchair is better off, but the old armchair is more comfortable. A person, a poor person, only sees the external side of wealth. Luxurious homes, expansive cars, ornaments, clubs, etc. If you placed a poor person in this type of environment, they would feel uncomfortable. And if you were to give them a suitcase full of money, they would do all sorts of foolish things with it until they had spent it all. The frequency of energy a poor person transmits is sharply dissonant with that of a wealthy life. Until a person lets the attributes of wealth into their comfort zone, and until they learn how it feels to be the owner of expensive things, they will remain poor, even if they find a buried treasure. And I can say that in my life. There is an energy to these objects and things that you have to capture. Another obstacle on the path to wealth is envy. Envy is want. And if you envy anybody's wealth, you will never have what you envy, ever. So what, if you feel envy for something or someone in your life, cut it because you will never have it if you ever express envy. To envy someone means to be annoyed by someone else's success. There is nothing constructive about envy at all. In fact, it is a very strong destructive element. A person's psyche works in such a way that if they envy something that another has, they try to devalue it in every way possible. This is the logic of being green with envy. I envy what he has. I don't have it and probably never will have. He is no better than I am. That thing he has can't be good for them. Perhaps I don't need it after all. The desire to possess something is transformed into a psychological defense, which then develops into rejection. The aspect of rejection takes place on a subtle level because the subconscious mind takes everything literally. 
your conscious mind only plays at devaluing the object of envy to comfort the person for not having it. But the subconscious mind takes it all seriously and bends over backwards to make sure that the person does not receive what has been so ardently devalued. You can see what tenacious forces hold a person to their lifeline of poverty. Events can unfold even more dramatically when a person undergoes an induced transition from a lifeline of prosperity to a lifeline of destitution. It does something sometimes happen that a per- successful person suddenly loses everything and ends up on the street. The most insidious thing about an induced transition to poverty is that the spiral begins to unwind slowly and then picks up speed until there's no stopping it. The spiral starts with temporary financial difficulties. Anyone can experience temporary difficulties. They are an inevitable part of life, just like the rain on the day you plan for a picnic. As long as you do not get angry about it, depressed, excessively anxious or resentful, being deprived of a potential source of energy, the pendulum will come to rest. The induced shift only occurs you somehow grip the spiral's tail the spiral can only start turning if you react to the destructive pendulum a person's initial response is often to be disappointed this is quite a weak source of energy so if the emotional response stops here the pendulum will be stifled anger and resentment are stronger forms of emotional response which might lift the pendulum spirits enough for it to convey the information that someone else is to blame for the fin- person's financial difficulties. The responsible to a second prod might be making negative comments, taking action against those who are supposedly to blame. By this time, the pendulum will, quite, will be quite revived and begin the second turn of the spiral. At this stage, the person may receive a reduced income payment, prices may rise, or some debt might suddenly be called in. At this stage, the person probably does not realize that a process has been set in motion. It could seem to be nothing more than the result of unfortunate circumstances, whereas in actual fact, it is the result of a directed process which has been induced by responding emotionally to the pendulum's prod. The frequency of that person's energy will continue to change from a vibration characteristic of a prosperous lifeline to a vibration characteristic of a new lifeline in which they suffer deprivation and annoyance. As a result, they shift to lifelines that correspond to a new set of financial circumstances. The situation is compounded and bad news starts to come in from all sides. The prices rise and their company's performance level drops. They discuss problems with close friends and relatives. The conversations are usually of destructive nature full of complaint, resentment, and aggression towards the guilty party. This can be particularly pronounced in companies where business is especially bad and the working day begins with the statement, there's no money coming in as solemnly as if it were a morning prayer. At this stage, the person is totally gripped by the spiral and the energy attuned to the frequency of the destructive pendulum. Seeing the things are constantly getting worse, they become stressed and anxious. Despite its relatively insignificant magnitude, the pendulum can easily assimilate the energy of anxiety and so it becomes all the more audacious because the adherent is so stressed They inevitably generate excess potential, discontent, aggression, depression, apathy, resentment, and so on. As balanced forces connect with the pendulum, the situation snowballs out of control and the fear they begin to experience drives them to distraction and things become frantic. It is as if someone has taken them by the hand, spun them around and around only to let go abruptly making them fly off to one side. The poor adherent falls to the ground where they lie in a state of shock. The the finale is not a pretty picture, although it started with just a few financial difficulties. Of course, it is not money 
that the pendulum needs as much as the negative energy a person generates when they realize that their money is literally going down the drain. By the time the spiral has unwound itself, the unfortunate individual has at best lost much of their wealth and at worst lost everything they had, which point they are no longer of any interest to the pendulum as they have nothing more that can be gained from them. The unfortunate adherent will either remain lying in shock on the unsuccessful lifeline or try with difficulty to pick themselves up from the floor. Such an induced transition can happen to a private individual as easily as to a large group of people. In the latter case, as you can imagine, the spiral is like a massive whirlpool from which it is impossible to escape. The only way to avoid an induced transition is to avoid gripping on to the tail of the spiral. Second or third time he said this now. Gripping on to the tail of the spiral. Tell me in the comments to this video, to this podcast, what you think he means by gripping onto the tail of the spiral, thereby avoiding getting caught up in the pendulum's destructive game. It is not sufficient to know how the mechanism works. To remain free of the pendulum's power, you must maintain a constant awareness of it. You must not allow your inner guardian to doze off. Pull yourself up every time you realize that out of habit, as if in a dream, you have accepted a pendulum's game, i.e. you have expressed discontentment, indignation, anxiety, or contributed to a destructive discussion and so on. Remember, everything that causes you to express a negative reaction is a provocative prod from a destructive pendulum. The same thing happens when you're dreaming until you realize that you are seeing in a dream. You are simply a pawn in someone else's game and there is nothing to stop you from being tormented by nightmares. As soon as you wake up, shake off the delusion and realize the nature of the game. You are in control. When you do this, you will no longer be the victim of circumstance while everyone around you continues to exist in a zombie-like state. Remember, and I'll repeat that last part, everything that causes you to express a negative reaction is a prod from a destructive pendulum. The same that happens when you're dreaming until you realize that what you're seeing is a dream. You're simply a pawn in someone else's game. And there's nothing to stop you from being tormented by nightmares. As soon as you wake up, shake off the delusion and realize the nature of the game, you are in control. Everyone creates the separate layer of their own world. This is the summary of what we've just gone through. Essentially, he at the beginning says that we all create our reality but there's layers of reality when you start to figure in the layers from the past and the future and at the beginning we talked about how generations form and that there's featured into the layer of creation that we've had from generations that we're supposed to get older that things are going to supposed to get worse that foods become less that music doesn't sound as good and that is not true that we can change this that we can tap into a different vibration the world of humanity consists of individual layers placed one on top of the other. And he specifically says these layers are on top of each other. And when a person emanates negative energy, they compromise the quality of their own life layer. So just by just any negative energy that you put out, imagine it's just like water, that's a liquid, whatever you put out. And then it's like also a magnet. So it's like pulling something that is similar to you. Aggression, the next thing to know is aggression is mistakenly taken to be a strength and dissatisfaction is a normal reaction. Reacting to negative events induces a shift to negative lifelines. An induced transition is accompanied by a negative event in a personal life layer. Do not allow negative information into your lair. Just 
just do not allow it. Watch something positive. Watch positive music. Listen to positive songs. Read positive books. Just for a little while. As a challenge to you. As a challenge to you, just let it go. Let go of the negative energy for a, mo- a week, a-, a month. And see what happens. And remember, the caveat, the final caveat is do not allow does not mean strive to avoid, but rather to intentionally ignore, to express no interest. All this stuff, you don't want to get sucked on it. There's really good, strong stuff about about poverty and pendulums. It's great stuff about panic. Some great stuff in this chapter. And in this day and age, with all the stuff that we have going on, we can see all around us people being sucked into these vortexes that are that are around guns or war or whatever it is. And I'm not saying any of that stuff's bad, but but it but there's negative lifelines where every all the stuff that you think is bad is happening is actually happening. And you can pull yourself into those. And I'm saying, I'm saying this out of true love and a desire for you to have the very best life. Behind all the stuff that I've talked about in these chapters is a very wonderful secret. To be focused on the moment. To be grateful. To be happy. And to react in a positive way. And find things to be excited about. Especially in the morning. Be aware of your attention. Be aware of your energy. Sure hope you guys got a chance to listen to the interview with Cynthia Sue Larson. Oh my God, it's incredible. She talks about coming from the year 2500. And possibly being the reason for the Mandela effect. So if you haven't listened to that interview, you have to listen to the interview. She talks about quantum jumps and it's very interesting. Do you ever need any coaching? Check out my website at advancedsuccessinstitute.com. All episodes of The Reality Revolution can be found at therealityrevolution.com. It's always with intense gratitude and great joy that I get to share with you. Even if it's just one person that watches this video or listens to this podcast, that makes me happy. And it's my hope that by taking some of this complicated information, it can really change your life like it's changed mine. And I'm hoping that that this information can seep in. So I'll try to create a meditation. Now, I might... Go to the next chapter, which is one of my favorite chapters, and I can't wait to do a meditation on the alternatives flow. But I wish everybody the very best, and I will talk to you very soon with peace and love. Welcome to the Reality Revolution.